Hi, welcome to Balihana, a world organization that unites through creativity. For most of us, our creative potential has been blocked, shamed, starved, or silenced. And then that energy can get into the world in toxic ways. But if we unite within ourselves and our world, we can change this. In 1992, Balihana was born to help humanity reach its true potential through creativity. Here's how. Your daughter, Alexis, was in a very special program last summer, Power of Music, New Hampshire. Yes, she had been going through some things herself, as teenagers do, and the Power of Music created a, a doorway for her to start doing her musical things with other people. I believe it was about six weeks Mm -hmm. um, I think there were two sets of three weeks, actually. She would come home and she had a journal and she mm -hmm. would write her thoughts and mm -hmm. her feelings in the journal. And she would take those words back to this class. And uh -huh. the words that they journaled in their time at home, they would bring back together and then share with each other. They would then turn those words into lyrics for songs. Mm -hmm. And those words and the lyrics to the songs were ways of emotionally dealing with the things that they're trying to process in their worlds and you know the things they're going through that we as parents don't always understand. When you bring music into it, all of a sudden it opens up a way for kids to share and get to know each other. And this gives them a safe place mm -hmm. where they can express their feelings, where they're not going to be judged. Uh -huh. They can put it out there musically, they can put it out there emotionally. Mm -hmm. And it works for all different kinds of children who have either emotional things they're going through or just you know everyday things they're going through. I think my daughter was going through a lot of things that a lot of kids do go through at that time. You know, all of the, the stuff they're exposed to and do you say yes or do you say no? And, and how, how do you respond to all of that? And they have what we'd like them to do and then they have their own thoughts. Mm -hmm. And this was a place where they could put that all into words mm -hmm. and process it. has done a couple of different performances with this group mm -hmm. and they are also working on a recording mm -hmm. that will be out there so that other kids can hear it okay. and maybe it'll help them mm -hmm. to process some of their feelings and understand that you know they're not the only ones who feel it. It's a beautiful thing that they can make this into music because it's an art form. It shows that they have something in common. You know, they have an expressive way that they deal with life together mm -hmm. and so they have that in common and then they're joined and I believe my daughter was joined with these other kids mm -hmm. through music. We decided to write a song like around the mask. It was a theme. We just came together uh, once a week and we came up with this idea. It's about how people are behind what people see. When you're writing lyrics for a song, especially this one, you really get into it. Like, you feel like you're the person that's in the song, and when you write it down, it's really coming from inside, and um, it's just really fun to write all this. Tell us a little bit about your piece, Ig Ignorance, mm -hmm. that's the name of the song. I wrote it in the early 90s, and I was living in Hungary, Budapest, Hungary at the time. It was uh, about the start of the Yugoslav Civil War. There was a civil war and most of their Europe wanted to keep their hands off of the Yugoslav conflict. I saw all this coming and I was just so angry that they just could have done a few things to to help stabilize it and not let it go out of control like it did, you know, and sow the seeds of anger and hatred for another generation. I found out that, uh, that she was holding a um, concert for um, t 
to, uh, for music to heal. And, um, and I told her, well, I think I have a song for you you may like, because I had just made up a song about a month ago. It just came to me, you know, came to me from somebody else, and then the melody just followed right behind it. And um, I, I kept those lyrics very close to my heart, and it helped uh, rebuild my marriage and strengthen my soul. And, um, you know, that life is not so complicated. You know, just trust yourself, just follow your heart. Now, many people are get to hear it and pass on that message so it could help other people out. Healing really seems to come with music. If you just choose to open your heart in the process of listening, yep. have you found that? Yep, and it's great the way the other musicians are um, working at the song and adding on their little um, individualness together and then it all comes to unity. And it's group effort, you know, wow. it's not just one person. Well, I can't wait to hear it. What happens when you're out of your comfort zone? You learn things about yourself. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Want to share? <laughs> what you Just that up? you can do things that you didn't think that were, you know, your crutches, like music. I'm not reading from sheet music. I'm listening for parts. Okay. And so finding those parts. and Ah. Yeah. So you're relying so, on your uh, ear. ear now mm -hmm. and finding out you can do that, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. It's nice to see all generations working together and creating something and having other people see everybody working together and what you can accomplish, not just in sports or creative. You come away from the rehearsals like more connected to other people and hopefully that's what everyone else will feel too. Have you noticed, being a songwriter, that a lot of inspiration comes from really painful experiences? Yes, I have. <laughs> yeah. um, it's where a few of my songs have, have derived from, actually. Um, I, you know, I try not to be analytic with, uh, with emotions, and I try to just more so translate them to paper and, and music and, and my songs, but I have found that most of the time I feel most inspired when, um, when something negative has happened in my life that yeah. has inflicted those painful emotions. You go deep inside and you connect with others, exactly. souls as well. Exactly. Um, that's, and that's ultimately what I hope to do with, mm. with my music is to, uh, to reach out to other people and really, you know, maybe they've had a similar experience or they can relate to it, but, you know, it's not only the words but also the, the music that really, um, they can really feel it in, in, in their soul and, you know, inside of them that they can just really feel the music. So that they can appreciate all it is that you do. To you, we are the greatest of gifts that you could possibly receive.
Everybody on the planet is a member of one generation because nobody has yet crossed the gap from this breakdown scenario to a breakthrough civilization. And so we're right at that tipping point, as, as many people say, and there are no elders that you can say understand exactly how a planet shifts from high-tech, overpopulated <laughs> to sustainable, evolvable world. Nobody. So everybody, whether you're eight or 80, are members of one generation. But I like the name Generation One. And one song <laughs> for Generation One would be a very good idea. You see, I'm 83. And sometimes if I'm with a person who's 12, <laughs> who's extremely brilliant, and we're chatting, and here's this 12-year-old, and here's this 83-year-old, and one time during this conversation, I just took this person's hand and I said, you know what? We're one generation. It doesn't matter because you haven't been through this. I haven't been through this. You know more of some things. I know a little bit more about something else. <laughs> and there was a uniting of generations. And you know, there's a uniting of so many elements in our life now, our relationship with earth, with each other, with different religions, with different faiths, with different sexes. So I would like to proclaim generation one and instead of having all these different generations where the young get somehow separated out by the millennial or, or, or this generation or that generation, if we're all in it together, it makes a very big difference. Music's the universal language. Anytime you can um, use it to heal or to make things better is a tremendous advantage and dealing with kids is especially um, a sweet spot, tender spot. So uh, this seems to have all the ingredients roll it all up and we have a great project which hopefully will deliver a great result. Yes, yeah. exactly. Music heals. Idea. And I love bringing uh, young people from around the world together to create something that's so vital, that affects us all, and that we can all participate in. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea of doing one song because I think that brings us back to one accord. Mm -hmm. Because um, it brings a, the, the mindset that says I'm separate and I'm alone and I gotta do it all. I think that brings us back to be conscious that oh no, we're all in this together. And what can we do to create one vibration, one harmony, one love, one peace? And I think this is this part of it.
Hello? Hi, is this Ron? This is. Is this Adam? This is. You're the lead singer, is that right? So far, they haven't kicked me out, so. <laughs> <laughs> what we all have in common is we emphasize writing from the heart. A lot of us up here on this stage feel that we're in pretty difficult times in this world, and we think the common denominator is music. Do you remember Franz from Music Behind the Mask? Absolutely. How's everybody doing today? Great, AJ. How you doing? Pretty good. Good. Good to hear your voice again. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, I uh, sometimes watch the DVD and uh, reminisce. I like the video you put together. Alone in cold child. That song came from... Uh, was was influenced really by my daughter. I've had an ongoing problem, and and still I'm losing her to drugs, and she's 43 right now. Daddy injects a needle to Feeling alone, separate from others, and in despair is why Team Power of Music was created. If we expect our youth to stop willing, we as adults we and politicians and must stop the blame game in. negativity. A drive-by shooting took her brother's life. I work with a lot of kids that want to go to prison, and that's the other side of it because they find that glamorous because there's nothing else that they want to do, which goes back to when you tell kids, if you play music, if you dance, if you write, if you sing, if you work really, really, really hard, good things do happen. If you dream, dreams come true. As human beings, we all have potential. It's just getting that out and feeling you want it. When I go do lectures, I ask people, as young as 18, as old as, you know, 60, what do you want to do when you grow up? And some people still don't know what to answer. And because we're only here for moments, you really got to figure out what you want to do. That seems to be the purpose in life. Every town, I do believe, has community schools, and a community school is the very last stop before a juvenile hall. That's okay. where we want to catch these kids. We don't want these guys going to juvenile hall. We don't want to get them too toughened up. We want to have these guys have the knowledge. And I think it's really important to catch these kids probably from the sixth grade on up. If all communities got together, it would not be that hard, and, and we wouldn't be having this discussion. Because right. everybody would put up a couple of dollars to make sure that all of our kids were taken care of. And that's what it is. It's all of our kids. We all live in the same planet. We're all in the same place here. Because if you don't put money in these kids now in the programs, you're going to invest in them later on. You're going to be building more county jails and more prisons. I don't know back there, out here since 1981, they've built 32 prisons and only one college. 85% are there for nonviolent drug alcohol crimes. They had third grade reading level. Well, right. let's start thinking about this. And when you're abused yeah. and you're from poor families, bad education, bad food, you know, you're going to make bad decisions. Right. And, and that's where it starts. Yeah. And I tell kids now, you know, if, if you write a song, you may not be a big rock star, but you wrote a song. And if you write a book, you may not get it on Penguin Books, but you wrote a book. Or you've learned how to dance. Or you've learned how to do something. But and that's the most important thing. If you just try to do something and keep searching. At 57, I'm still searching. Right. You know, I, I still keep on trying to hope, have hope that there's going to be something out there that I can make that change. And that's why I wrote my book. Beautiful. That's the way I write the songs that I write, because I just think it's really important that we keep on keeping on. Connecticut State Police responding to reports of a shooting at an elementary school in Newtown. Two young men apparently dressed in long black trench coats opened fire at a high school just outside of Denver. There has been a school shooting at Taft High School in California. The act of a lone gunman at a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado. Gunfire aimed at elementary school children. The two guys came into the library and were just shooting everyone that they could.
We have to learn that when we forgive, that forgive that forgiveness comes, you know, with wholeness and the and the experience of what true freedom represents. No matter where the barriers or the hurt, the wounds or the pain is coming from, we must all begin this for, this journey to forgiveness together, arm in arm, spirit to spirit. So we want to be able to recognize that as we move as Cherokees to forgive each other, that we can begin to accept forgiveness. And the beauty of being, of experiencing forgiveness is when I ask you to forgive me, I must, I must afford the same consideration when someone wants me to forgive them. Oftentimes we get caught up in that and if we forget that when someone asks us to forgive and it's easy oftentimes to do that. But then when we are asked to forgive, then we are quick to forget that consideration that we had just, that we had asked for. This is a bigger plan than us. And all we're doing is following a, a, you know, an urging that God has put on our hearts to have ex events that people can experience just a small sampling of what healing looks like and what it represents. And then they can decide if they want to continue be because of that experience. We're not in charge of the healing process. We're not, the, we're not the great physician. He is. All we are is people with a, with a willing spirit and recognizing that if, if God can heal us, He will also heal you. People said to me, you know, what's a white man doing going on the Cherokee journey to healing and forgiveness? Um, and some people didn't say it because they were too polite, but they were thinking it. And I said, you know, my people were on that journey too. My people were the politicians that voted for the Indian Removal Act. And my people were the politicians that argued against it and lost. My people were the soldiers that came to people's homes and marched out women and children and men at the point of a bayonet. And my people were the missionaries that told that story to the newspapers all over the country. My people were the neighbors that collected blankets and food when the people were removed so fast to give to their neighbors in the stockades. And my people were the ones that swept in immediately afterwards to burn the homes and burn the crops and steal the livestock and take the food and take the crockery just as quick as they could. Excuse me. So this is our story too. And I don't know how we're gonna heal until we tell that story. So I've been doing some reading around, you know, honestly, my question, what a, what a, what's a white man doing on a forgiveness journey? My question is, how can one people do this to another people? I mean, especially given we all know that the Creator just made one people. Right? And I think it comes from telling the wrong story. We've told ourselves the wrong story. And that story, the story that we brought with us from Europe, was a story of white supremacy. We lost sight of the fact that we are one people among the many, and we told ourselves a story that we are one people above the rest. And once you start telling that story, it's just, it's poison 
for the heart and the spirit. I'm deeply sorry for what my people have done, for what I myself have done, and I'm I honestly don't know how to live with the fact that I'm the beneficiary of the trauma that you've suffered. I'm not going to ask for forgiveness. Because I don't feel like I have any right to ask. And because I think before one can ask for forgiveness, one needs to stop the evil that's being, that's asked for being forgiven. You know, way back when the, um, the Congress was debating, you know, can the Indian people be civilized? And a little later on, they, they were debating, you know, are Indians really fully human? And it's really clear to me that we had it backwards. And the question that we were really answering in those debates is can we be civilized? Can we treat our brothers like our brothers? The question we were asking, we're answering, is uh, can we be fully human? Can we look in the mirror and see not just the people that look like us, but all the people that Creator made? And you know, back in the 1830s, I think we came up short on both questions. I'm not sure that we would do a whole lot better today, but I give you my word that for myself and for my son and for my family, I will do my best to tell the truth and to heal. For those of us that don't, un that don't understand, and I'm only just learning uh, the history of what actually happened on the Trail of Tears from a Cherokee perspective. Mm. Oh, yeah. For, um, we know it in how we're raised in our own history books, which oh, honey, it was really just a paragraph. Yeah, the, right. the Native Americans were relocated in, in the American history books. It's an exactly. entirely different story in reality. There was a letter that was written by a Union soldier that was part of the, the uh, escorting to uh, on this northern route okay. and he wrote a letter and said he thought that he had seen the worst of man in the civil war with hundreds of people being killed in one field wow. he said that doesn't touch the cruelty of this oh and oh my god it brought tears to my eyes so that um. that gives and that was a handwritten note that was preserved Wow. That that trail of tears, they didn't call it that then, but this removal act was the cruelest thing he had ever seen. Children dying. Aww. And they and as these the Native Americans, as the Cherokee, many, it wasn't just Cherokee, you know, all oh, the no, tribes. It was were all, the, all the tribes. Yeah. Yeah. And as they made their journey and they died, they wouldn't even allow them to do ceremony to take care of their dead. Oof. They had to leave them. Oftentimes oh. without even burying them, oh. you know. So it, it was, it was a cultural, absolutely horrific shock to everybody that was, you know, that was involved. Even the soldiers that had to march them. The forgiveness journey is all about being in the now as well, right? Absolutely. So yeah. is that the whole purpose of doing the Trail of Tears again and the healing ceremonies? Well, it was. Patty had a vision. Okay. And her vision was a vision of healing and forgiveness. Now, as she had that vision, a monument came to Cherokee from Tahlequah. Hmm. And that monument was transformation through forgiveness. Beautiful. And it was a 16 foot high bronze monument of a Native American wrapped in an eagle. Hmm. And so that monument came to Cherokee. Patty had her vision. She went out to, to Oklahoma and talked with the chief of the uh, Cherokee Nation, the chief of the Katua Band, and they all wanted to support this effort. It's beautiful. And so what it evolved, and there was a three-year planning period, mm -hmm. but what it evolved to in, in 2012 was a journey to forgiveness and healing. What took place is that Cherokee left the koala uh, boundary on a bus and we drove out to Tahlequah and then we were stopping at seven significant places on the northern route to come back to Cherokee. There's three recognized federal tribes of Cherokee. The Eastern Band of the Cherokee, 
the Cherokee Nation, which is by far the largest, and then the, uh, the Katua Band. So those are the recognized tribes. One of the most unique things before we started doing the Trail of Tears backwards, you know, for forgiveness, was that they did a stomp dance. Okay. And a stomp dance is a religious ceremony okay. of the ancient ways. And that was the first time that the tribes had danced together since the Trail of Tears. Oh my. The intent was to come back mm -hmm. on the Trail of Tears backwards. And so we did walk some of it, but it was, you know, a bus ride from one location to the next. And, um, and we did healing ceremony. And Don Kiowas was the facilitator. And he had a, a, um, a hoop because, you know, the Native Americans, uh, their thinking is circular. You know, the hoop, the sacred hoop is representative of, of their life generation after generation. Okay. And it was a hoop of a hundred eagle feathers. Mm -hmm. So it was just a powerful. Magical. And then a mask that also had a mask. Uh, yeah, eagle feathers on it. And so um, we would do healing circles, you know, at each location. And they would last up to three hours. I mean, it went wow. to the to the innermost part of your being, huh. and uh, so when we started uh, the, the very first healing circle, uh, some of the children were very honest, and they said they hated the white people. Okay. They didn't know why we were there. They wished that we weren't on the journey, you know, <laughs> and you know, and, and sure. just very and genuine. Honest. Sure, you know, which was that's the that's the safety of doing this healing. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you. You know, by the, the next, that went on for three hours, you mm. know, and a lot of tears, a lot of wailing, you know, deep felt emotion. And the intent was to honor those who have passed by there mm -hmm. and to um, ask forgiveness from the, the, the our, our ancestors, whether it be the soldiers that marched them or the, you know, the Native American for, for what took place and to not carry that hatred any further. What they did, they forgave the unforgivable. They released the past so that they could live now and have their future. That's the key. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. The, and generations pass it on. Oh, what, absolutely. What we don't heal ourselves is passed on. Absolutely, for and, seven generations. Right? Yeah. Right? And, and um, so this, this journey that the Cherokee made was so important because the tears that flowed were, were expressed to prevent the next seven generations from having to feel that. And so the idea and the, what they're doing now is trying to continue this journey. And so, you know, when you're in high school or when, when I was in high school, we did our senior trip, you went to different places. Well, they're trying to incorporate this, the trip to offer to, to students Okay. at Cherokee because the healing begins with the youth. Right. It's real important to, to, to stop that vicious cycle. And you know, those who went, um, it, it changed their lives. Sure. And so those children are going out into communities now, you know, and saying, well, no way to mentors. Mentor. Yeah, yeah, as mentors. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's what it's, in my opinion, that's what it's about. The part of the story, interesting you just made the link, that I didn't even recognize is that we came over hurt and oppressed also. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, instead of the image of us coming over as if we had it all together, and mm -hmm. this and that, we were coming over as wounded right. people as well. Absolutely. And so we were reacting and acting out, claiming right. from the outside versus the inside. Right. So it is the forgiveness of global forgiveness. Absolutely. Of passing behavior on from culture to culture yeah. and then trying to get control of it elsewhere outside of ourselves. Yeah. The time is coming for all of us to remember who we really are. Right. And the one song is a another step in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and, and we are, we are all one. Mm -hmm. And you know, and so we have to recognize what we do to others is what we're doing to ourselves. Right. You know, and as we carry hatred and carry pain and grief from, from past generations, we're really hurting ourselves with that. You're not hurting the people that you're hating, you're hurting yourself. And that's that's the releasing. You know, so we don't wanna not just have to release, you know, 
what's going on with others, but we have to forgive ourselves. We've got to forgive ourselves for yes. what we did to survive. Right. What we did to get through the traumas of our life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that we carry that guilt with us if we don't. Right. And that will, will tear us apart and keep us closed where we're not open to the one sound, not open to that, that knowing. been involved with using horses for healing and equine assisted psychotherapy was called and I had become aware of substance abuse and a lot of challenges that the youth in Cherokee were having. Okay. So I invited doctors and nurses from the hospital to come over to Horse Sense of the Carolinas okay. to learn about using horses for therapy. In dealing with addictions as yes, well? Yes, in dealing with addictions. Interesting. Yeah. So how does that work with with the uh, horses and therapy? And oh, it was it was a, it was a beautiful experience. The, you have to experience that to know what it is. Right. You can't explain it. So. Right. Right. So when they came over and they worked with the horses, and there was a lot of emotions that came up for them even. Okay. For the doctors and the nurses and the uh, therapists, and so they got a, a taste of what 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 it was really like. And, and the, the key to horses is that a horse is, is an animal that is preyed upon. Ah. So they read energy very well. Yes. And so if your inside doesn't match your outside, they let you know. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's how it works. And they are very large animals. Right. So there's a natural, hmm, a little respect for that size, you know, especially right. your child. Even adults, though, sure. it's very effective. And so as they start to do exercises, it's not a riding program, it's a, okay. a communication program. Interesting. And they realize that, you know, if I don't communicate honestly with this horse, it lets me know. A oh. horse that senses contradiction will move away. Interesting. Yeah, a horse that senses aggression will move away. So they help you set boundaries? Yes, perhaps? help you set boundaries and help you learn to communicate in a different way and also build up confidence and self-esteem. I've heard and experienced, it goes a little bit deeper in the healing process to work with horses and oh yeah, much, much getting to the core issues versus just kind of skimming the surface. Oh, absolutely. You, you can't really, if you say you more use the skills that you have used. Human skills. Right. Ah, you can't use okay. those skills that you've used to manipulate therapists with a horse. It doesn't work. Right. So so a horse reflects what, what's going on inside of you. It's authentic. Exact, yeah, very authentic. Okay. Very consistent. Non-judgmental. Beautiful. You know, but it's like, huh. <laughs> Wonder why that horse ran away from me. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, so you have to look inside and say, oh, well, yeah, I was a little bit upset today, you know, and then the truth starts to come out. And, and I've actually seen horses, this is the, the truth, that have gone to the far end of the arena right? when somebody is not matching inside to outside. And because that's their, you know, with that, what's a horse's uh, survival technique? The first thing they do is run. Right. Yeah, they only fight if they're cornered. Okay. Okay. So, you know, they will move away as much as they can from danger. And so I've seen the horse go to the far end of the arena. Mm -hmm. And as the, the person that's in this therapy uh, session starts to open up and heal, and their, their insides start to match their outside, I have literally seen a horse walk from the end of the arena back up to that person and lay their heads on oh, their back. Oh, how beautiful. Oh, and the, and the, the guy just crumbled, you know, wow. because he realized what he was doing. Yeah, so it's, it's an awakening. It's a, it's a powerful therapy. Many children came out, many uh, to do therapy for, for a good while. Uh, some of them were diabetic. Okay. And so it helped with their diabetes because it helped their self-esteem and it helped them learn to, to set boundaries and control what they were doing. Interesting. And also we got children from a, um, a lockdown facility, which were not just Cher Cherokee. This is a facility um, that is used for any Native American that has not been responding to, uh, to therapy. 
traditional traditional therapy. therapy. Okay, and um, and it, it's really the the final step between Cherokee and federal prison. Okay, if they don't clean up at this, then 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 they're going to go to prison. And so it's it's an opportunity. Okay. And so they come to this facility on the eastern band of the Cherokee Indians, uh, Koala Boundary. And we had several. We had that for for several years where the the children the, the, that have been exposed to the worst of the worst okay. came and did therapy with the horses and it was it was it was just a magnificent thing to experience. Break the cycle. I broke the cycle. Jimmy, the music of the 60s, uh, who were some of your favorite bands of the Woodstock generation that you remember? Uh, yeah. Joe Cocker, Santana, Paul Butterfield, you know, and uh, of course, Zeke Giza, you know, Giza. The Gizas. Yeah. Yeah, what a shame when they broke up, huh? Yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. You know, I was really, really big fan. I, I heard you were the king of pranks. Uh, that one goes down in history at one of the festivals. Yeah, I, I couldn't help myself. But. <laughs> the, the, the new term is called PTPTSD now, which is a portable toilet post-traumatic stress syndrome. Oh. All concert goers <laughs> now <laughs> have suffered <laughs> a panic over. Yeah, I think uh, I, I started. They think that. of Jimmy Z when I they think that. of. Uh, yeah, well, as it happens, you know. I have the utmost respect, respect for Z, you know, I, and, and still do. <laughs> but I couldn't help myself. I, we were at a big festival, and, you know, just all the biggest stars, Mick Jagger, Led Zeppelin, everybody was there. And we're all backstage, you know, outdoors. It was a big outdoor arena, I think, in Philadelphia. About 100,000 people. And everybody, I, everybody was going, hey, there's Zeke, you know, these people. And then I, I was going, oh, yeah, man. And so then <laughs> there's this little grassy knoll, and at the bottom was three, <laughs> three porta potties, and uh, the people backstage. And I saw Zeke taking off down the hill towards the porta potty alone, <laughs> and I was just thinking, hmm. and then all these people were like, "Wait, look, Zeke, he's going to take, he's going to have a slash, you know, and all this, you know." And I'm going, "Geez," and, and then I went, "Hmm." So I kind of slipped away, and I. I was behind him a ways, and I, I made my way down towards the porta potties myself. And by the time I got there, he was already in one, and I could hear him, <laughs> you know. And so I just, I don't know why, I just, I just went, I grabbed it, and I went, wow, 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 wow. And he's going, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and I look, I'm laughing, I look up the hill, and there's all these like Tom Petty, uh, superstars, and everybody, they're going, <laughs> and, you, know, I, and I went, oh. you shook Zeke. <laughs> and how did he handle it? Well, I made my way back. I was with Tom <laughs> Petty at the time, and and uh, it sounds usually like, hey, what's happening? You know, real kind of slow country guy. And I got to do goes, Are you out of your <laughs> mind? I was Zeke Gazer, man. I said, Calm down, calm down, man. It's going to be okay. You know, and like, I can't believe you did that, you know, and I'm, I'm with a bunch of people around it. But everybody's looking down that hill at that porta potty for Zeke to come out and shut up, the door opens up, slams open, he comes out, little stinky face, and he's looking, <laughs> looking up the hill and he's got these faded Levi's on and he's you can see a pee stain all down his pants. <laughs> and I started busting up again. <laughs> Really close to getting fired that day. <laughs> we, had, we, had, we, had a, we had a fun, funny thing. A fine line between, fine line between humor and unemployment. And right, I, right. I was riding that line big that day. Yeah, you. But, but he, he I, I think he had a sense of humor. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs>
Wild Willie, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's many drummers. You asked me about drummers earlier. Wild Willie really sticks out. He, he was just a class of his own. Uh, I couldn't believe it when the geezers broke up. I thought, Wild, I mean, what? Wild Willie will go on to be, you know, the, the phenomenal, the phenomena that he is, you know. And I, I, I just don't know what happened, you know. But now that I hear the geezers are getting back together again, I'm like... Well, that's the rumor. What, what's it going to take for us to get them back together for World Stock? Oh, I don't know. That was a bad breakup. I mean, you that's, know how bands are. That's, yeah, Wild Willie. Well, just to, just to hear that name again, you know, being performing is like killing me here you know i mean i really want I, well what, what will we what can we do to get the geezers back together for world stock well what does it take to really want to play again and worth putting everything aside i don't know money i don't know i don't know <laughs> uh it, it's it's like uh just maybe if everyone gets together and everyone kind of like like roots for the geezers and and uh, just to get them going again because we need them. This world needs the geezers and to see Wild Willie. I want to see Wild Willie playing again. Giza fans, they are going to play after all. They've taken a slot at 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. If you're anybody, you ought to be there. These dreams are haunting to me. Keep waking up at 3. I pray that they will see the shame and pain still inside of me.
Okay, Zeke, you are useless. Okay, look, bear right. Do you see that rock up there? Bear to the right, further, just, okay. Just get out of the seat. I'm done. Just get out of the seat. I'm going to take over from here. Just, I don't want you driving this boat ever again. You are useless. was getting gas at the gas station one day and I saw Barbara in my rearview mirror and I got out because I teared up mm -hmm. because I felt how much she had done for my daughter in helping my daughter express herself and I jumped out while they were filling the gas tank up in downtown <laughs> Wolfboro and gave her a big hug and thanked her.
the one. Into the F major thing. Ben? Is that the end part or the solo yeah. section? The end? Yeah, what I'll do is I'll actually, we'll, we'll do a <laughs> I should do a run down there. You're doing? Yeah. If not. You're there, I'm happy. Let's do a couple takes of that. Ooh. That was great. Okay. You're there, I'm happy.